majesty Let creation bow Let creation bow And hail you as the
is like you, Lord, faithful and true. You bring your people through the seas. Who is like you? Who is like you, Lord? Renews my 
Welcome to church. It's great that you could join us this morning wherever you are. Hope that you have found a home. I hope you are with other people gathered around listening to God's word and really seeking to grow. If you haven't been able to be around somewhere or you're at home by yourself, why not invite yourself or ring somebody else up and say, it'd be great to see you. Invite yourself over to somebody else's home or have someone come to yours and enjoy this time together as we grow in our love and knowledge of our Creator, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Today we continue our series looking at the Sermon on the Mound and Jesus continues with some hard words for us. Love your enemies. Love your enemies? Aren't I supposed to hate them? Can't I just really get angry with them and turn them out? Wouldn't it be easier if they just went away? Love your enemies. Today, Joe is going to look at what Jesus has to say at some very tough words 
again for us and will call us to respond to him and give praise and glory to our Lord and Saviour and what he has done for us. So let's start our time, this time in prayer, as we come and hear God's word wherever we're gathered at this time. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died on the cross to bring us forgiveness of sins. We pray this morning, Father, as people who were once alienated, once enemies of you, we pray, Father, that you will teach us to have mercy on those who are, we are angry or at war with. And in the same way as you were merciful to us, teach us to love our enemies, to conform our hearts, and to respond to Jesus in thankfulness and with grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come hear the angels sing, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Gathering round the throne, hail the Son of Man. Son of man, but for their sin he died. It was no angel crucified, and yet they rolled him in their sight and lived to praise the Lord. Come hear the elders sing as they fall in praise to the We join in heaven with our God. A people from every land, crowding round the Lamb, crowding round the Lamb. We'll sing salvation song, how many million voices strong. We'll sing the glory of the King, of Jesus Christ our Lord. Great to hear from different church people and see how they're going. Let us watch this video as we see another member of our church. We're in the car. Hi everybody. Cassandra and I are in the car and I thought, hey, I know Dave said that we should post a video about what post life is like. And so I thought like. this is pretty real. Um, what's challenging now is that we do fizzy on a Wednesday and unlike before where we could sit inside we now have to sit in the car and wait. Um, I'm thankful that we don't have um, heaps of activities like this during the week because I think Cassandra would go a bit crazy and so would I. Um, but yeah, I guess everyday life activities have changed. School pickups changed. Uh, what we do has changed. And um, it's important to keep everybody safe and do the right thing. But uh, I guess it just adds a different level of parenting um, Especially when you consider things like where we should go and 
who we should socialize with and what's acceptable and what's not um, thankful um, for us all being relatively healthy at the moment um, I was pretty sick towards the end of last term but feeling better now um, thankful for good Christian music um, and for online church that's been a real encouragement uh, also I think um, God has been trying to teach us that through all things um, he is with us and life was never meant to be easy um, but we just need to hold on to him uh, no matter what happens anyway we um, Mayfields hope that everybody's doing okay and um, yeah Hopefully one day we'll get back to church the way we know it, but until then, uh, God bless. We're going to look at God's Word. We're going to have it read for us, but let us pray before we look at Matthew 5, 43 to 48. If you haven't got a Bible, now would be a good time to just go and grab one so that you can read along as we hear the reading. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray as we read your word that we will respond to you with faithfulness and with truth. Pray, Father, that you will work in your, our hearts by the power of your Spirit and that you will transform us and make us like Christ, that we will learn to love our enemies. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew five thirty-eight to 48 from the CSB version. Please join me. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you going, doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. My gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will say, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will lead. been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven, the future
future sure, sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. Some time ago, a fellow called Michael Hart wrote a book called The 100, a ranking of the most influential people in history. Uh, who do you reckon to be on that list? Who do you reckon to be right up the top? Well, surprise, surprise, number one is Muhammad. Muhammad, he says this, My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questionable by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and the secular levels. Today, 13 centuries after his death, his influence is still powerful and persuasive. Now, bear in mind, this is a white American who's writing this. He's no fan of Islam. And whether you agree with him or not, what he goes on to say is that Muhammad's followers are more zealous to obey him than the devotees of any other group, religious or otherwise. And they're like that on a mass scale. You might think of the odd group of zealots following people like David Koresh, you know, who give their lives for him, but it's not on the scale of Islam. You have millions of people, five times a day, bowing towards Mecca, the place of Muhammad's triumph in prayer. Number two on the list. Well, you guessed it, it's Isaac Newton. Uh, the guy who gave us mass and science and gravity. Well, he didn't give us them, he didn't make it. He, he just realised how they all worked and put the system together. But to him, to Michael Hart, Jesus ranks number three. And he says something very interesting about Jesus and why he's not in the first two positions. He says, Jesus undoubtedly taught many wonderful and fantastic things, started a massive religion, has got billions of followers down through the ages and through the world today. But he says that Jesus' followers obviously don't take his words as seriously as Muslims take Muhammad's words. And his great example of that is our passage from today. One verse from it, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who persecute you. And he looks around the world at Christians and Christendom and Christian leaders and he thinks, who does that? Christians do none of those things. Now, my guess is that not many of us have experienced a true enemy, someone who just absolutely hates us and is out to ruin us and make our life a misery. But if you have had that or have that now, then you know the feelings that well up within, the desires for revenge, the hatred you feel back, the urge to lash out when you, when you think of the name of that person or when you hear their name or you see them coming. Uh, the Israelites, you know, that would have been the Roman Empire to them. They were under occupation. They hated the, the oppressors. And, and if you've experienced that, you know exactly who that person is 
And, and I take it you know how difficult Jesus' words here are. For most of us, we can probably think of people we don't like that one much or don't agree with or maybe even make life tedious around the office or a family member, but we wouldn't necessarily call them enemies. But, but Jesus' words are just as applicable and, and they probably still make us just as uncomfortable. Love that person? Really, Jesus? And so either way, you're probably sitting there feeling the, the temptation to minimise to domesticate, to reduce, subdue what Jesus says so they don't ha really have the same force that, well, he sounds like he's saying, which is precisely the reason that Michael Hart puts Jesus only as number three on his list of the 100 most influential people. You see, the natural reaction we all have when someone does something against us, whether it's deliberate or just accidental or something else, is to get them back. It's to lash out. It's to fight them. We instinctively love the idea of revenge and taking our pound of flesh. You know, imagine watching an Arnie movie and, you know, it's a great action movie and you get to the end and Arnie's finally, after all the hurdles, got the upper hand. He's pinned the bad guy to the wall just with one hand, lifted him off the ground, even though he's a 300-pound monster himself. <laughs> and he says to him, Bennett, I know you are a bad guy, but I forgive you. In fact, let me give you a massage. You go your own way and live a good life. I won't take revenge. Yeah, that, that, that movie would just tank at the box office. People would be standing up, yelling for their money back at the door uh, because we want to see the bad guy get blown away. We want to see th the hero win and we at least want to have the police come in and do something about it even if the hero won't. And that's what makes Jesus says so hard. It's not hard to understand his words, but it's hard because we don't naturally want to do it. It, it goes against every fibre of our being. And it's one of those miracles of God when we can come to grips with it and we start to learn how to live as Jesus tells us to here. Now, before we get into it, we've got to look at the context. Jesus, remember, has been swamped by crowds. They've come because he's a great healer. They've been bringing their, uh, their sick from their family, all from all over the place, from hundreds of the kilometres. It's an international crowd. They've been flooding into the cities and he's withdrawn now to the country and up onto a hillside in order to teach his disciples. To teach them, if you want to be my follower, this is what life's going to look like. This is what the lifestyle of the kingdom of heaven is. This is how to be fishers of men. The Sermon on the Mount is, is discipleship training. This is, this is what Jesus wants from us, is how to be a follower of his. He's, he's not teaching them doctrine. He's not teaching them the doctrine of salvation or of the Holy Spirit or, or how predestination works or, or what heaven looks like. He, he's dealing with the character and lifestyle of his people and particularly how it is that we're to be different, different to everyone else. So different, in fact, that that will be like salt. And it hasn't lost its saltiness, it's just worthless and just blends in and bland. It's, we're like a, uh, to be like a, a light on a stand, not under a bowl, the light that's hidden, the light, the room, uh, or like a city on a hill, completely different to the way that the world operates, different in, in motivation. We, we do good, but we don't do it to get praise for ourselves. Jesus' disciples do it to, to bring praises to their Father in heaven. Remember back earlier in the chapter and different in their standards. Jesus calls his disciples to have a righteousness that's far greater than even that of the Pharisees. See, mind you, were the religious do-gooders who always kept the rules, who were always down on everyone else because they just lived so righteously. <laughs> but Jesus is calling us to a different righteousness, a, a better righteousness, a bigger righteousness, one that, one that comes from the heart. That's not just about ticking off the the moral rule saying, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. It's one that wants to love God and serve him. A new heart that doesn't just refrain from murder, but refuses to hate. In fact, that seeks the good of the other person. And when there's a breakdown in relationships, seeks reconciliation and will do everything to, to restore the friendship. A new heart that doesn't just uh, mean we keep our pants zipped up and don't jump into bed with anyone we're not married to, but one that 
refuses to undress other people in our minds and, uh, and, and lust after them and doesn't seek to seduce and, and, and flirt. And you might have thought that was challenging enough already and I know lots of people have been asking questions and doing some soul searching and, and, and I hope that you know, you've come to a place where you're working on those things. But in our section today, Jesus moves on to something that's an even greater challenge in the way that we deal with people who hate us and who do evil to us. And just like with all those other examples, he starts off in familiar territory. Verse 38, you've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I assume that just like now, Jesus' hearers would have been nodding and thinking, yep, that, that, that sounds right. In fact, it's even biblical. It's in the law of Moses. Three times it turns up in the law of Moses. In Exodus 21, 23, two men are fighting and they in accidentally injure a pregnant woman and maybe hurt the baby as well. They have to pay. They've got to pay an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Or Leviticus chapter 24, verse 20, if you injure someone else and maybe if you kill them, whatever injury you inflicted is the punishment that's due to you. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Or Deuteronomy 19.21, if, if there's a malicious witness who lies in court in order to get someone else found guilty of a crime they didn't commit and they're found out, the witness is found out, they are to pay whatever the punishment that was due for the crime. They must, it must be inflicted on them, whether it's life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Right? If that was what was due, that's what you received. And, and it sounds fair, doesn't it? In fact, there's a word we have for that. Justice. It's justice. The law, the law of Moses, is upholding justice. But notice even before we get to Jesus, a couple of important things about, about those laws. First of all, they're, they're not commands to any one person to exact justice themselves. All of them are laws about what judges are to exact as punishment in each case. It, they're not about personal revenge or taking the law into your own hands. They've punched you, so you get to whack them straight back. They're all laws establishing what a judicial system should look like. In fact, what Israel's judicial system should look like. If you're watching The Cuttering Room Floor a couple of weeks ago, um, it's, it's civil law as opposed to moral law in terms of the threefold division of law, civil, moral and ceremonial. It's part of that civil law. This is how the nation is to operate. This is how the justice system. But notice, secondly, that the rules limit the damage of retribution. It, it limits it up and down. You can't, the judge can't say, well, uh, you took that guy's life, so pay me 10 bucks and you go, you're good. Or you really hurt that person, and so if you make them a peanut butter sandwich, it'll all be fair and square, right? So it limits it down, but it also limits it up. You can't take two eyes for one eye. It's just punishment. It's punishment that fits the crime. It's not like in Sharia law, where the thief who stole a loaf of bread has to have their hand chopped off. A hand is not a loaf of bread. It is completely unjust, unfair. Whereas the courts, the courts of God's people, are to act fairly and impartially. Right? They, the judge can't just favour one and not favour another. He's got to act fairly and this is the system. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, hand for hand, foot for foot. But what do people do when they hear that that's in the law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. They immediately want to use that themselves and take the law into their own hands. And, you know, we want to, and we feel totally justified when we do take revenge. We want people to suffer who's hurt us, right? And, and if we know we can't get away, we want someone else to make them suffer as well. You know, if it's the police or a friend, you know, your, your big brother's going to come and bash you up just like you were threatening to bash me up. But, but like every example so far that Jesus has given, Jesus, he's, he's like a black belt in verbal martial arts and he puts the moves on. He's going to sweep our legs from right under us. Hear what he's got to say. Verse 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, he's the leg sweep. Don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, 
Turn to him, the other also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He's not undermining the law of Moses at all. He's not attacking the judicial system and the way it should operate. But he's probing so deeply, isn't he, into our hearts. In fact, what he's doing is heart surgery on us. He's talking about us having a heart attitude that would be a miracle of God if we were to do it. A heart attitude that we're to have towards other people who deliberately hurt us or who take away from us. An attitude that doesn't just say, I won't fight back. It goes beyond that. It won't just say, I won't, I won't give as good as I got. I'm not going to demand my pound of flesh. I think if Jesus stopped there, maybe he'd find some willing hearts. But he goes way further. He says, don't exact revenge. In fact, do the opposite. Give more than they've asked for. Give them your, sh your shirt as well as your coat. Give them, you know, walk two miles instead of the one they've asked you to. It's, it's totally um, counterintuitive and countercultural. And many people have said, well, maybe Jesus is just using a clever tactic to stop evil. And it's, a, it's about reverse psychology. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Surely that's it. Because you go two miles, it will publicly embarrass them. You know, everyone will go, oh man, that's, that's too much bullying that's going on. It will shame them and they'll stop because what's, what will be the fun of picking on someone weak who doesn't respond? Well, I think people who say that obviously uh, haven't understood the joy and satisfaction that bullies get from what they do. It's not going to stop them. Maybe once in a while, but that's not what Jesus means and it's not why Jesus said it. He's not teaching us to trick other people with mental gains and psychological tricks. It, it's completely something else. And you can tell that because of what he goes on to say next. And if you thought what he'd already said was hard to listen to, well, have a look at this, verse 43. You've heard it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. And I assume, just like before, that Jesus here is to be nodding and thinking, yeah, yeah, of course we've heard that. That's just, that's right, isn't it? Again, the first half, love your neighbour, that, that's even biblical. It's again from the law of Moses. And it doesn't seem too big a stretch to, to think that God could well have meant the second half, you know, hate your enemy because your neighbour is not your enemy. Surely that's the natural extension. But Jesus is just so clinical. He's so incisive. He's cutting off all attempts we might come up with to limit the law because my neighbour is my neighbour whether he likes me and helps me or whether he despises me and picks on me and bad mouths me and so he's dropping a bombshell in an already controversial talk it's shocking it's totally radical and he says it so brilliantly so starkly that there's absolutely no room to wiggle out of what he says You've heard it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you see, there's a footnote there, other older manuscripts uh, of the Bible, Jesus pushes even further. He says, bless those who cursed you and do good to those who hate you. What do you mean do good to them? Right? They've just hurt me. They've wounded me. They've always been picking on me. They've been after me. They've been made my life a misery. And you want me to go... Feed them when they're sick, you know, tend their wounds, pick up their children from school. How, how could you say that, Jesus? But Jesus is just saying, in regard to the person who's hated you and mistreated you and made your life a merry, don't just not hit back. Don't just give them more than they were taking. But in fact, treat them in the way that you wish they were treating you, in a way that's loving and kind, considerate, in a self-sacrificing kind of way. And by love, he doesn't mean you've got to adore them and kind of fawn over them and bat your eyelids and your heart's going to flutter as you time the world. He's not talking about Stockholm Syndrome or anything like that. Uh, no, love is to seek someone's best. It's to seek their good. It's to do good for them. And you think, are you serious, Jesus? He can't be. How could he be? No way. I mean, 
possibly under the right sort of circumstances in a very limited way, we could potentially show a little bit more care to people we don't have much to do with, right? Who we don't necessarily appreciate all that much, but come on, surely there's got to be limits to it. Surely there are people we could be excused by Jesus for not loving in that way. People who just don't deserve it. There's got to be restrictions. There's got to be circumstances that, that, that Jesus meant to say or that got lopped off when Matthew didn't hear it and sort of just forgot to write that bit down. Something that must qualify it. But no, Jesus means what he says and he says what he means. There are no circumstances, there are no restrictions under which we as followers of Christ can get out of someone lo loving someone like that. Whether the person is a friend or a foe, whether it's a lover or an enemy, Jesus is telling us that love your neighbour, which the law commands, deep down at the heart level means love them even if they're haters who only do evil to us even in situations of great personal cost, even if they take everything from us, don't fight them, give them more, but more than that, love them, do good to them, pray for them, bless them. Now, there's a great example of that kind of thing, of a Christian living that way in the, the musical or the movie, if you're lowbrow like me, Les Miserables. If you've not seen it, uh, it's, it's a great story. And it's about a man named Jean Valjean who, at the start, he's a thief and, and he's staying with this priest and he decides to knock off all the silverware. In the middle of the night, he runs off having ripped off the priest, stolen all his goods and he's you know, hot-footing it down the road. The next day, the police catch up with him and uh, they, they go to arrest him. He's there, got all this silverware that they know where it's from. But before they can drag him off to prison, the priest comes running up with, with two can silver candlesticks and he says, Jean Valjean, Jean Valjean, you forgot to take these as well like I asked you to. And it's a very generous act, one that stops him being arrested and uh, one that saves him from rotting away in jail, which he would have done, one that he's very grateful for for the rest of his life. But it's exactly like what Jesus is saying. And to make the pointy end of the, the stick even sharper, Jesus goes on. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. The tax collectors who everyone hates, they're the most miserable, scum-sucking mongrels out there, right, who are in bed with the enemy. Even they love those who love them. And if you greet only your brothers or sisters, what are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do that? The Gentiles, the, the pagan people who don't even know God or love him, they know how to do good to their brothers and sisters and family and greet them well and only care for those who care for them. He says, if we only love those who love us, then, then we're going to be no different from the world. That is, we wouldn't be salt. We'd be salt that's lost its saltiness. We'd be a light that's under a bowl. We wouldn't be on a stand. We wouldn't be a city on a hill. The world says, love those who love you. The world says, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. The world says, you look out for me, I'll look out for you. The world says, my love is totally conditional on whether you're nice to me and your attitude towards me and whether you're going to make me feel good. Jesus says, Love unconditionally, without restriction, without condition. And the question is, why? Why does he tell them to love like that? How could there be any good reason, Jesus, to say such a thing? And as I said, it's got nothing to do with reverse psychology. It's something else entirely. And Jesus tells us exactly the reason why we should love in the way that he says, why his disciples have to love the way that he says, from the heart, not like the world. It's there, you see it? It's in verse 45. I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Verse 45, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends 
the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The reason that Jesus calls on us to love our enemies in this way is precisely, it's exactly because that's what God does. God doesn't say, well, you over there, you know, you're my friend, have some sunshine. You, you scum-sucking idiots over there, I hate you and you hate me, have a tornado. You know, the drought we've been in for several years now might teach us a lesson about dependence on God. And, and there are many sins to be repented of as a society, that's to be sure. But, but God's still giving us sun and he's giving us rain and he's giving us cross and the dams are filling up. It's uh, it's not a bad day as we record this, but we cannot conclude because of that that Sydney is a righteous city that is blessed by God. It's, it's not a righteous city in any way. But it just goes to show how unfathomable, how outrageous God's love is, especially when we start to realise that the state of things is much worse than that. And we need to be very clear the natural state of humanity, of people, is as enemies towards God. We're enemies of God. Sydney, Sydney's in open rebellion against God. Right? It hates him. It hates God. It hates his ways. The city and its inhabitants, we're at war. And it's not a, just that we're caught up in a war like a neutral country in a war between, say, God and the devil, you know, like we're not the Switzerland or the Sweden in that war. No, no, the war is between God and humanity. It's between God and people. It's between God and me. A war in which there can only be one winner because he is all powerful. We might look like we're living at peace. Our country, our state, our, our city is in one of relative peace, of prosperity, of stability. You know, COVID may have put a dampener on things, but, you know, the economy will recover and the power's still on and the roads are still there, the, the trains are still running, everything goes on as if nothing's really wrong. But actually, in terms of spiritual realities, we live in a city where people are at war with their maker. That's the way the Bible describes it in James chapter 4. Anyone who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. And yet it's his enemies who God chooses to save and bestow his amazing kindness and mercy on. Christ came to save sinners. He didn't come to save the righteous people, the nice people, the, the well-to-do people who need a little bit of help to, to get on their way and to relate to him better. In Romans 5.10, it's why we were enemies that we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And so how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? It's his enemies that God offers forgiveness through the cross of Christ. It's his enemies that he pays an incredible price, the death of his son, in order to save. It's his enemies that we are reconciled to him. And so we're no longer enemies when we have Jesus. We become friends of God. We become children of God. We're reconciled to God. The old hymns capture it so well, don't they? Love's divine or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Or one of my favourites, here might I stay and sing, no story so divine, never was love, dear King, never was uh, grief like thine. This is my friend, my friend indeed, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. And God is calling us who have been granted such tender mercy and forgiveness and love, who've, who've experienced that love and experienced that reconciliation. He's calling us to, to act in the same way towards our enemies. Not because they'll necessarily change. Most likely they won't. <clears throat> Not because... <clears throat> Not because they won't slap us on the other cheek or kick us when we're down. They most probably will. In fact, let them. But do it because he has gladly accepted the loss himself and he wants us to be like him. Now, that's a costly and a difficult thing which he's calling us to. And those of us who are in the midst of experience tremendous difficulty and 
with particular individuals. I'm not suggesting any of this is easy, nor am I trying to belittle what you may be going through, the feelings that are going on in your heart. I have sat and cried with many people over broken relationships where the other person has refused to offer any relief. I, I, I know it's hard. And I'm not suggesting it'll ever be easy. It may do, and in God's kindness there may be relief and, and God may well change the person. But Jesus is clear here, it's not dependent on the responsiveness of the other person. It's not. It's because that's what God does to us and we're to be like him. So how do you do it? How, how would you even start? What, what does it look like to, to love your enemy like that? Well, Jesus gives us some very practical things to do. And, and if you don't know what else to do, here's, here's three things to begin with. They're, they're all in verse 43, uh, if you include the footnote as well. The three things are bless, do good and pray. Bless, do good and pray. He says, bless, don't curse. Don't curse them behind their back, but, but wish them well. I like really wish them well. Uh, speak kindly with them. Don't argue the toss every time. Don't tell them to go and get stuff. Genuinely, from the heart, want the best for them and tell them. So when your friends want to write them off and they tell you to get stuck into them, don't be a party to it. You know, you're standing around the coffee machine at work. Everyone's bitching about the boss or about that narky client or about that guy who doesn't fit in and everyone's just kind of... Uh, uh, he said, don't join in. You've got to bless and not curse. And so that's the first thing. The second one, number two, do good to them instead of evil. That means if they're, they're sick and they're going through some sort of distress that you know about, cook, cook them a meal. See if there's a way you can practically help them out. Do the shopping for them. Pick their kids up from school. Do good, whatever the cost. And lastly, he says, pray for them. Pray not only that they'll stop doing what it is they're doing and cease their hostility, but, but pray for God's blessing on them. Pray for their relationship with God. Pray that they might come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Pray that they might have their sins forgiven. That's what Jesus did when he was on the cross. As he was hanging there, he said, Father, forgive them as they're butchering him, for they know not what they do. Pray that God would look after them in the way that you wish they were looking after you. Pray for their blessed and pray that God will bless for them and prosper them. Bless, do good, pray. Jesus didn't just kind of whack it out there, love them without telling us what to do. He tells us exactly what to do. It's radical. It's difficult. It's incredibly practical. But Jesus wants radical disciples who not live the way of the world, but will be completely different from it. They will live his way and glorify him. Be, be like our heavenly father, salt in a saltless world, light in the darkness, like a city on a hill, living the way of our father in heaven, not to bring praise and honour to ourselves, but that others might see our good deeds and praise our father in heaven living in such a way as to bring glory in everything that we do and say to him. Let's pray. Father, these are tremendously challenging words that expose our world and our hearts. And we instinctively, like with all that Jesus said, want to react against them. But Father, please give us new hearts that want to live your way, that want to be like you, that see the cost but pay it anyway. We thank you for your incredible mercy on your enemies, on us, in the Lord Jesus, that you gave your only son to die when we, your enemies, despised you and hated you and you loved us anyway. And we thank you for the way you've brought us into friendship with you and you've called us out of the world to be different to the world. And so we pray as we live in the world but are not of the world that we might live differently, we might stand out, particularly in this way. Help us to do good even when we don't want to. Help us to love when we want to hate. Help us to pray for the people who hurt us rather than taking our pound of flesh. Father, we pray that we might do this 
for your glory and honour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're going to come to a time of prayer together now. And today we're going to spend the bulk of our time praying for persecuted Christians around the world. In 2019, one in nine Christians faced open persecution, not just snide remarks in the street, but suffered loss of income, loss of housing, loss of life. And in particular, we're going to pray for Nigeria. Out of the 4,100 or so Christians who lost their lives directly because of persecution last year, over 90% were in Nigeria. Would you join with me in praying for them? Heavenly Father, this is your world and your children are scattered throughout it. You have been kind such that in the Lord Jesus, the nations have found you. Father, you are gracious today to all of your children to have the deep and abiding hope of life everlasting, to know that in the Lord Jesus our sin is removed, our death is paid for, and our life is now hidden in Christ. And your Father, we are aware that for all of our comforts and for all of our freedoms, many of your children around the world face hardship specifically because they follow the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for them. We thank you for their example to us of men and women and children who are prepared to own the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, even knowing that it may be a death sentence. Father, we thank you for them, that on the last day when we are joined with them, their faith will bring so much glory to you that they will be like our older brothers and sisters whom we admire and look up to. And yet, Father, today we pray in particular for those who live in Nigeria. Our hearts go out to them, Father, as they suffer violence and persecution, as they are attacked and brutally murdered. Father, we bring before you today, as we think of loving our enemies, those who are perpetrating this violence. In particular, we pray for the Muslim majority of the Fulani herdsmen, as well as for Boko Haram, the two groups which are predominantly persecuting Christians. And Father, we pray for them not only that the violence against Christians would stop, but we pray for their good. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would bless them with the true and saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that their sin would be forgiven. That even these who are hard-hearted and violent against you and against your people would come to the Lord Jesus and be saved. We ask for extraordinary grace and peace and healing for the Christians. We thank you for the many witnesses and testimonies that have come out of these places of forgiveness, of open hearts, of work that can only be yours. And Father, we ask that the church will be able to withstand the pressure, that they will not give up their faith, that they will not seek preaching, they will not stop preaching Jesus, that instead they would seek your glory as they live out this Sermon on the Mount that we have heard, as their righteousness is fueled so clearly by the work of the Spirit in their hearts. Father, they often put us to shame. And so we ask, please, for ourselves, that we would be like them. That we would be like them in humility before you, that we would be like them in dependence, that our wealth and our comfort would not blind us to the fact that we need you. And instead, Father, in our own lives, as we suffer the persecution that we do, as we suffer the difficulties and our own enemies, May we truly learn to bless, to seek good, to pray for others. We ask, Father, for those in our context that are the most severely persecuted. We think of those who, because of their different ethnicity, might be cast aside, because of lack of wealth and means might be looked down on. For those who work in uh, in workplaces that are really anti-Christian, for those that have embraced progressive modern ideals and see Christianity as archaic or at worst hurtful and insulting. 
Strengthen us, Father. Give us the courage to stand firm for the Lord Jesus Christ, but even in the midst of that, to do good for others. Father, this is not our natural response. This is not our own inclination. And so we ask that you would do the work of the Spirit in us. May your word convict us that this is your character. May you develop it in us. That even in the worst of circumstances, you would be displayed for your glory, for your praise, for your honour. Amen.
This has been a wonderful time together as we've seen Jesus command us to love our enemies. We've seen as Joe opened up God's word that we are to bless our enemies, do good and to pray for them. This is a radically different message. It's different from a world which wants to rebel and continue its hatred and its grudges. But our God calls us to be different. Our God calls us to have a different attitude to those around us who we might want to hate, who we might want to be angry at. But God calls us to love as he loved us and to seek the best for everybody that they might know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour and live for his praise and his glory. So bless your enemies, do good to them, and most of all, continue to pray for them. God bless. Have a great week. The Lord, He is my shepherd. There's not that I need He hath dealt with all my sin I'll lay in pastures green I'll walk beside the peaceful waters so He renews my life Glory to God on high Though I walk through darkest valley I will feel no danger there For I know that you are with me Upon you I'll cast my care
pursue me all my days. I will dwell forevermore in the house.